acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in the elite and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I've just returned from a short visit to Turkey and North Africa, um, places which are on the edge of or involved in um, a lot of very dangerous stuff, a lot of, lot of conflict. And it was interesting travelling through those places to try and consider what meant, what, what allowed one country to be a place which was full of terror, anger, violence, hate, destruction, and next door, a society that wasn't, but which shared many, apparently, many of the same social and other characteristics. <coughs> and as I was reflecting on that, it became more and more clear to me and, um, that a lot of the issues that we're facing are issues about the way in which societies organise themselves in relationship to social inclusion and that society's capacities to equitably engage with all their members is clearly one of the most significant factors associated with peace in our time. But I'm a bit of an amateur on this and I'm um, extremely happy to be able uh, to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, uh, Steve Kilali, Kill, oh, I've done it, didn't I? Sorry. <laughs> Steve Kill, Lai. Oh, uh, Kill, Lai. Kill, Lai. Kill, Lai. Kill, Lai. Steve Kill, Lai. See, having a name like Yapagovic, something from Ireland, it just blows me out. <laughs> um, Steve is a um, very well established entrepreneur and businessman in his own right, who over the last 20 years or so has become increasingly involved in taking his great um, strategic insights and capacities to deal with issues of poverty and violence and so on around the world. And um, over that period, he's created um, the Charitable Foundation, which is one of Australia's major international uh, sort of not-for-profit private agencies engaging with <coughs> the poverty around the world, trying to make a difference there. And as he was telling me beforehand, as part of that process, discovering how important issues to do with economics and peace were in <coughs> engaging with questions of, of poverty. Um, over the last few years, about five or seven years ago, we established the, uh, the Institute um, that we're here uh, talking with today, the Institute for Economics and Peace, and that institute itself has become extremely important um, in world consideration of questions to do with terrorism and what we might do about it. And in particular, again, the relationship between terror, violence, peace, and economic development. Um, and as you'll, I think, discover in this presentation, not all of the relationships that people assume to be the case are actually the case. That there are some insights from the sort of research that the Institute's been doing, which has really quite transformative in helping us understand what might go, what might happen in the future. So the setup for today is, Steve will talk for about half an hour or so, then we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, Steve, thank you. So, thanks for that introduction, Andrew. Uh, now, the presentation I've got today is actually on terrorism. <coughs> now, is this working? There you go. Try. Forward? Ah, there we go. Okay, we're away. <coughs> Excellent, yeah. So the ter presentation I'm going to give you today is on terrorism. But I'll just maybe give a little bit more background on the Institute for Economics and Peace. So you've just got a little slightly more rounded perspective on what we do. <coughs> the Institute was set up to study the intersections between business, peace and economics. Places special emphasis on developing metrics to measure peace in what in uh, peace lingo is termed negative peace, so that's violence or the absence of violence, and also positive peace, which are the attitudes, institutions, and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. <coughs> so the major product we've got is the Global Peace Index, and today that's the world's leading measure of national peacefulness. So it's used by groups like the UN, OECD, World Bank, uh, Club of Madrid, and many, many more. And we've so been actively engaged in the UN, let's say, in shape one, one example, of the in terms of shaping the, uh, the post-millennium development goals around peace and governance. So we're one of the uh, only two 
outside organisations which developed a draft report from the UN which went up to the eminent persons committee in terms of drafting that. So we rank the 15th most impactful think tank in the world on under $5 million revenue last year and that's pretty impressive for an organisation which has only been going four years. Now, I was going to talk about anything, absolutely anything, positive piece is the thing which really moves and motivates me the most because we're actually really changing a lot of global dialogues around that and that comes down to actually looking at prevention. How do you create resilience within societies such that they don't actually ever fall into conflict? But today we're going to talk about terrorism. So we launched the index, Global Terrorism Index, about three weeks ago in the uh, Parliament House in the UK. It was hosted by the head of the All Parliamentary Committee on Terrorism, Carl Hilton Wood. It was one of the two, may, or one of the three major uh, global news stories for three days. It's on the home page of BBC World, a front page of The Guardian, front page of the New York Times. And after 10 days, it was something like, see, it was about 62,000 different references to the Global Terrorism Index in global news coverage. So for us, it's a pretty successful. But in some ways, this is going to be a fairly terrifying presentation. So what I'll do is cover the highlights, give you some of the trends on terrorism, we'll talk a little bit about the largest terrorist groups, countries most impacted, and then how to actually calculate risk for terrorism and what countries are likely to be affected by terrorism. So if we look at the methodology, I won't spend much time on this, but for those who are technically minded, this is always good. So what we do is we've got four indicators, a very, very simple index in a lot of ways. So incidents get a weighing of 1, injuries get a weighing of 0.5, deaths 0.3, and then property damage also gets assessed depending on the amount of property damage with a weighing of 1 to 3 for each terrorist <coughs> incident. We use a database which uh, comes out of the US, uh, US and the Maryland University called the uh, GTD, or Global Terrorism Data Database, and from an organisation called START. It's the largest collection of the uh, incidents on terrorism anywhere in the world. And we use a lot of rhythmic banding scales so that we can actually sort of graduate the way we actually do the measurement. And what we do then is we take a trailing impact going back over five years. So an incident which happens in the first year counts for 52%, one which happened two years ago is 26%, prior year 13%, prior year 6%. And that's to take account of the lingering effects of terrorism which does have impact over time. Now, if we just go back and just before we hit terrorism, let's look at some trends over the last uh, seven years. So if we go back over the last seven years, peace is actually, as measured by the Global Peace Index, has decreased by 5%. There's two things which have driven that. First is homicides, mm -hmm. and second is terrorist activity. So homicides has just slowly been increasing over the last seven years, and that's going to keep going. Today, 3.5 billion people live in cities. By 2050, it's estimated to be 7 billion. So 50% of the world today, 2050 it'll be 70%. So that means the number of people living in cities is going to double. And most of that's in the developing world. And if you move from the rural areas to the uh, you know, cities, what you're going to see is just a gradual increase in time crime because if you've got the levels of lawlessness, crime gangs and such, which go in all the emerging cities. The second one is terrorism, which has dramatically increased over the last two years. But one of the things, there's a lot of the publicity on terrorism, we hear a lot, but you actually, globally, 40 times more likely to die in a homicide than a terrorist attack. In the UK, and this includes things like the uh, London train bombings, as well as the bus bombings, it's 188 times more likely to die in a homicide than a terrorist incident, <coughs> just to put it into its perspective. Now, this gives you just an idea of the graph, which covers the rise in homicides 
going back from 2008. So 437,000 people were killed in 2013 in homicides. Now, that just drive it home a little bit of graphical uh, representation of the difference between homicides and terrorism. Now, we go back and we start to look at the change of terrorism. Since 2000, it's increased five times. And these are the major events which have happened along the way. You'll note September the 11th, after that, as we got down into 2002, 2003, terrorism actually globally had subsided quite dramatically. Then, with the start of the Iraq War, we can see how terrorism started to take off. And it surged in Iraq. From there, from, I from Iraq, you then got the invasion of Afghanistan, it started to surge again in Afghanistan, from Afghanistan, below, spilled over into Pakistan. Now, at the height of the troop surge in about 2007, there was a peak in terrorism, and since then, up to 2011, it had been dropping. Now, that was partly the troop surge, it was partly being able to get a reconciliation with the Sunnis, with the Shias within uh, Iraq and, and forming a, a coalition government. So, terrorism then was on the decrease. Still, the start of the Syrian war, as we can see then over the last two years, it's gone through the roof. Note, we just come down here to the rest of the world. So if we take that and follow that line, we can see that basically it's pretty much flat line uh, over the last 14 years. However, it's now starting to take off again. So now is that a new trend or is that just a uh, abnormality and will correct again. I think it's a new trend, but we'll come to more of that later on. So, 61 years so if we look at the number of deaths between 2012 and 2013, it increased 61%. Right, that's truly a staggering number. So that's from 11,000 to 18,000. As I mentioned earlier on, a five times increase. Five countries accounted for 82% of those deaths. So those countries are Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. Four organizations accounted for 66% of those deaths. So if we look at those organizations, are Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, Taliban, uh, Boko Haram, and ISIL. Now, 24 countries had over 50 deaths. That's a jump of 40% on the prior year. The prior year it was only 16, but we'll come to more of that in a little while. And the OECD countries, eight experienced deadly attacks. The two which experienced the most were Turkey and uh, Israel. Suicide bombings only account for 5% of attacks. Most attacks are on civilians or police. We'll cover that a little bit earlier on. And if we look at those four organisations which are responsible for 66% of the deaths, they all are described as some form of Wabi philosophies as taught through the Salafat schools. Now, this is just a simple heat map of the world uh, showing where terrorism is distributed. I'll just leave that there for a sec. Everyone can go to their favourite part of the world and see how well coloured it is. You'll note Australia is pretty good. So what the, the terrorist attacks which occurred in Australia relate back to three years ago when some Afghan refugees on an asylum boat let off some bombs, uh, killing three people. And that's the, that's the uh, reason why Australia isn't green. So now we look at the 10 countries most impacted by terrorism. We have them here. Note Iraq at the top, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, Syria, India, Somalia, Yemen, Philippines, and Thailand. Two of those countries are in our region and fairly close. One of the interesting things is if you look at the number of incidences to death, it gives you an idea of just how lethal different groups are. So if you look at Iraq, that ratio is about uh, one to three. Uh, it's about one to three in Afghanistan. It's nearly one to one in Pakistan. Nigeria is the most deadly, it was six times. So to give you some idea of just not all terrorist attacks are the same. The UK came in 29th on the index. Daily Mail's headlines were the UK 
29th most country likely in the world to be uh, hit by terrorist attacks, but it's not really true. If you dig into it, there were over 139 incidences in Northern Ireland of bombs exploding, no one getting injured. So the new IRA set bombs off outside police stations, government buildings, give out warnings, small bombs, the idea of disrupting, causing mayhem, and fear, but without actually resolving an injury. So different countries have different tactics. So this gives you an idea if you just look at the, uh, uh, the uh, spread of the uh, of, uh, terrorism, you'll know once you get past the top 10 countries, the rest of the incidents only happened in, 10% uh, 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 of the incidents only happened in the rest of the world. So what we're seeing is, in many ways, this increase in terrorism is very, very thick in a small number of countries. Now, what are the factors which are most uh, uh, closely associated with terrorism? So, I might start actually with not what's associated with it, I'll start with what's not associated with it, because I think that's the probably fascinating story here. Poverty measures don't actually correlate, neither, neither does mean years of schooling. As you start to get in, <laughs> antidotes of uh, people from the West going and fighting the street artists. A lot of them are really quite well educated. In the UK, many of them have got university educations. Life expectancy doesn't correlate, nor does economic indicators other than FDI. So foreign direct investment, is the terrorism scares off the foreign investment. It doesn't necessarily have a lot of impact on the local economy. Fascinating. But what factors are? Things like legitimacy of the state. It's the amount of what you call state-sponsored terror. In other words, what's the level of torture, what's the level of killing which is performed by the state on its own citizens. It's intergroup cohesion, which Andrew, we know, is an expert in. Uh, if we look at that, gro gross levels of group grievances underlying all. If you think about Syria, think about Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you can see all that, about, all that there. And the other thing is a higher level of violence generally. So terrorism thrives in lawless environments. And we'll come back right at the end of this to how terrorist organisations finish. And that will come in and play into how most of them finish. So if we start looking at the four groups uh, and we look at the, uh, the uh, responsible 66% of the deaths, this is the way it's broken up. A lot of emphasis on ISIL with the Taliban twice as lethal as ISIL. Just keep that in mind. Um, Boko Haram is probably more lethal than what I thought they were. And Al Qaeda is a much, much weakened force. But if you look at ISIL, it's really a breakaway from Al Qaeda originally as well. And so we did the research, what we found is with the terrorist groups, a lot of them tend to, they're, they're amorphous, they tend to get under pressure, they break up scatter, then reforms different groups mm -hmm. in different ways. Now, we start to look at how terrorist groups end. Uh, this is pretty fascinating. 83% of this is based on a RAND study that uh, looked at uh, 283 terrorist groups which ceased to exist. So, you went back, and the uh, research went back to uh, about the mid-1960s, so it's pretty extensive. 83% of them ceased through a combination of the uh, policing and also uh, a, a, a political process combined with it. Uh, uh, when you get over a thousand terrorists within an organisation, that's active soldiers, let's say, uh, are very hard for policing alone to solve it. At that point, you need military intervention. But alarmingly, 10% of them actually achieve their goals. Another 7% only were defeated by full military force. Now, we went back and we went back over time. That's a fascinating graph. It gives you the, so it gives you the number of deaths in 2002 for the 10 countries most affected by terrorism, and then compared to 2013. But what's interesting, if we go back, then you can see the difference, it's quite stark. But if we go back to 2002 and we start to look at the active uh, uh, countries affected by terrorists, and terrorists then and look at what happened. So Sudan, that was a political settlement. 
Middle East fallen back in the Civil War twice since then, but it was a political settlement. Algeria was a political settlement. India's still going on. Russia was a military, a, a military outcome, although we're starting to see terrorism starting to rise again in Chechnya. Israel's ongoing. Colombia's probably going to be solved in the next five months with far from a political set, a settlement. Indonesia was a civil, political settlement. Nepal was a political settlement. Pakistan is still ongoing, and Uganda is a military solution. The LRA, they've been pushed out into the Congo. So that's how we went back to 2002, and that was just one year snapshot how all of them finished. Now, let's have a quick look at trends. So these are the number of countries where you've had greater than 50 deaths. Uh, uh, uh. So we know 2000, 2013 at 24. If we go back to the prior years, you can see it pretty much flatlined. There wasn't much change. It's just the last 12 months. And what worries me is this could be a trend. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the success of ISIL and the international uh, uh, coverage which it has. It makes other organisations think that terrorism is the way to success as well. So my gut instinct is we're not going to see that decrease next year. We come back now and we look at the five countries with the biggest increases uh, in uh, terrorism. Iraq, 164%, Pakistan, 28 Syria, 71 Nigeria, 30%, Afghanistan, 13%. Now, if we look at ISIL in Syria, most of the deaths there would be seen as a uh, legitimate uh, uh, war and have not been accounted, uh, have not been accounted as terrorist attacks, whereas in Iraq, uh, the activity there, a lot of it has been terrorist attacks. So attacks on army, where it's a, uh, where it's a done in battle conditions, isn't included as terrorism. It's where it's a, uh, you have attacks on civilians, police, government uh, facilities, etc. Okay, these are the biggest increases. Now, there are a number of quite large increases here, but the, the number of the uh, people who have less have died is very, very much less. So if we look at Yemen, which is the biggest with 15%, 52 less deaths. Compare that to Iraq with 3,400 uh, uh, more deaths. So I'll give you an idea of the difference. So although some countries have improved, it's nowhere near enough to offset the decreases. Now, if we look at the ideologies uh, flowing, flowing through this, and we go back to 2000, you can see that national separatist movements are what one's trying to see some sort of uh, political uh, gain pretty much uh, stayed the same, although it jumped up a little bit over the last two years. We can see a huge increase in religion, and again, that goes back and corresponds with the start of the Syrian war. Now, if we look at trends by regions, it's very, very different. So if we look at this, say, uh, political organisations, they dominate the Central America and Caribbean. Uh, if we come around then to look at national uh, separatist movements, Russian and CIS, they dominate there. Also very big in Europe and uh, Asia Pacific as well. However, if we come around and look at religious, so in the Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, that's the dominant reason for terrorism. Now, this one, Grace, is for me really quite fascinating. So, quick, whoops. So, if we come back here and we'll look at those two lines there. So, this one here is the number of attacks on private citizens. So, in about 2008, 35%. Same year, attack on police was about 10%. Now, watch how these two lines have merged over time. Attacks on private citizens have gone down, attacks on police have gone up. So at this stage now, we're both about the same at 25% each. So should destabilize, so terrorists are learning that if you kill people they're trying to away uh, get territory they're trying to take, that turns them against them. So we're turning on the institutions and police. But that's a double compounded problem because as you create more lawlessness, now you create the environments in which terrorism can actually thrive. So a lot of the time they're involved in uh, 
activities such as extortion, uh, kidnapping to make money, and so if the police are being mobilised, then that gives them a right environment in which to really operate. And also, if we come back and look at the, uh, the combination of solutions, which is 50%, uh, which is a combination of policing and a political process, they destroy the capabilities of the police, and it's a lot like less, they're a lot more likely to be successful. So, policing is something which I think, in terms of the uh, activity and in terms of being able to improve, uh, it's something that's really necessary. So we come back now, look at fatalities, uh, yeah, tax by fatalities, about 60, about 55% uh, don't know of fatalities. Greater than 10% of the tax involve a uh, fire fatalities. Now, we come back and look at the forms of the tax, we look at suicide uh, bombings. They get the one which get the most publicity, but they're really a small number of the actual attacks. Most of them are bombs, okay? So, incendiary <coughs> bombs. Uh, most, no, most attacks are bombs or done with guns. So the Middle East and North Africa is the most prevalent place. South Asia, second most prevalent place for suicide attacks. And after that, it's very, very few in other parts of the world. Uh, if you look at fatalities uh, in the OECD, 5% fatalities. Uh, it was eight countries in the OECD last year had uh, people die from terrorist activity. Turkey was the largest, it had 57 people die. Uh, four of them were PKK. The other 53 were ISIL, and those 53 people died in just two terrorist attacks. So we'll just quickly go through the largest groups. So this will give you an idea of the changes over time for the terrorist groups. A lot of emphasis on ISIL, uh, which is really appropriate because it's getting territory, but if we look at the Taliban, the number of fatalities from the Taliban, and this uh, doesn't go well uh, uh, for Afghanistan with the now the starting with the war drought, uh, with the drawdown of US troops in Afghanistan. So the Taliban is the one which is just keeping on going through the roof. Now, four deadliest groups, this is the uh, gives you an idea of their incidents, fatalities and injuries over time. Al-Qaeda over time, um, this is going back since 2000, it's been a, 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 a had the uh, in most uh, fatalities, if you were, or the most incident, in most injuries plus fatalities. Taliban next, ISIS coming up, and Boko Haram uh, further down. Now, if we come back and we start to look at the uh, four deadliest groups, they all subscribe to some form of Wahhabi philosophies. Uh, and they all, we get a lot of emphasis on girls' education, but it's much, much more than that. It's the rejection of Western education as a concept. And so, I've got this quote here, it's, a, it's a, from a, uh, uh, Muhammad Yusuf, which is the founder of Boko Haram, just to drive home just how much they reject what we'd see as education. And it's like rain, we believe that in the creation of God, like, we, like rain, we believe it's a creation of God rather than an evaporation caused by the sun that condenses and becomes rain. Like saying the world is a sphere that runs contrary to the teachings of Allah, we reject it. We also reject the theory of Darwinism. So it's pretty, pretty profound. The Boko Haram literally translated means against Western education, just to drive it in. Now, the groups all have different aims, but how do you counteract this? Because this is really sort of exported from Saudi Arabia uh, through a lot of a very heavy funding over the last 30 years. So really, the way to counter it is really through moderate to the uh, Sunni philosophies and getting them propagated. India was quite successful with this, so they're getting a lot of radicalisation there probably about a decade ago. And they counteracted to that with some of the key moderate uh, uh, Sunni uh, theologists putting out fatwas which contradicted the teachings of the, uh, the radical uh, Salafist schools. And then that was propagated out through all the uh, uh, out through all the mosques by thousands of imams, and that actually worked. Now, 
really that's what needs to happen in many ways in the Middle East to get moved to underwrite or uh, with the legitimacy that a lot of organisations are having. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff which is underway now to start to try and do that. So hopefully three or four years from now we'll start to see <coughs> impact on that. But it's something which is very, very difficult for the West to, to influence. It has to come out the heart of being a cynic theologist. Now, if we get down and we look at the uh, number of fighters uh, within each of the groups, so the Taliban, by uh, uh, far, has got the most number of fighters. ISIL comes in pretty close to it. These figures are a little bit old. Like more recent figures have, have at least 35,000 uh, uh, fighters with ISIL. That's probably growing as they get more and more, as they solidify themselves in the territories they've got in Iraq. Now, this will give you an idea of foreign fighters uh, from the, uh, the uh, uh, Middle East and the uh, countries. So, one of the things which is interesting, the only democracy in the Middle East, other than Israel, is Tunisia. And uh, it's got the most fighters, so, uh, on the low estimates, going uh, and fighting in, in Iraq and in Syria. So, what you'll see is a massive difference between the lows, the highs, and then the government estimates. But you'll find that there's places like Kuwait, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, and the UAE, particularly the UAE, and they've got quite a, they've got a lot of the, a lot of Sunni uh, uh, and uh, uh, got a lot of the Sunni and Shias living together within their societies. Yet they're not getting a lot of people going and fighting. There's stuff there we can learn which can actually help on the inclusiveness and the integration processes which can undermine the causes of terrorism. So this is from the West. Uh, uh, Belgium uh, has got the largest, uh, you can look at the low numbers, the largest number of foreign fighters. It's in Belgium about two weeks ago. I had a uh, lunch with three members of the Flemish parliament. And each of them from the districts they came from had the most number of the uh, Belgians which had actually gone and uh, uh, fought in uh, Syria. It was interesting, the reasons for them going were very, very different from the reasons why people in the UK and why they were going and fighting. So different cultures, different societies, different motivators which caused people to go and join uh, these groups. Now, just come back to the country's mess and I'll finish up in five minutes most impacted by terrorism. I'm going to move through this really quickly. So this gives you a set of graphs. What we'll do is we'll just focus on a few things here. And we might just focus on the trend lines. So we'll take the 10 countries and we can focus on the trend lines. That was when you had the US troop surge. That was the war in Iraq. Fell off, was still there, and then really two years ago started to take off. The real reason this has taken off is one, is that you've got Syria, You've got a situation where they're able to get soldiers to go in there. They're able to actually train, become really quite effective as a force. And then with the breakdown between the, uh, Shia, the, the unity Shia and Sunni governments, Sunnis are feeling a, uh, uh, like they're being exploited. Therefore, they're now ready ground for recruits and off it all goes. So if we look at Afghanistan again, you can just see the steady rise, which doesn't bode well for the next few years. Uh, Pakistan, same thing again, the steady rise. Nigeria, same thing again, the steady rise. Syria, obviously, we see that take off of the war. India has actually got a trend line going down. It's up the last 12 months, but I wouldn't actually see that as a trend yet. We need to watch how it goes in a few years, but it's moving down. Somalia, we see it had peaked, but it's the last three years has been moving up again. Yemen, there's a flat line the last three years. Philippines, had a flat line, but it's taken up again the last 12 months. Again, I wouldn't necessarily <coughs> actually see that as a trend line, we need to wait for a couple of years. And Thailand, sort of peaked about 2010, and slowly, uh, gradually going down. Now, one of the things we 
it, uh, so we looked at sort of how can you actually determine what countries are likely uh, to experience increased terrorism in the future. This was based on what we came out of it. So 70% of the deaths in, uh, from terrorism occurring actually in conflict zones. So if there's conflict, and the conditions are very, very similar to a, 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 what we described earlier on with lack of state a, a legitimacy, high levels of group grievances. So we looked at that, there were six countries which fit, fitted that, which we thought could suffer from terrorism. Now, we've also identified another seven countries with a, a, which were in the bottom 25% for state-sponsored violence, like extrajudicial uh, killings, a, a, a gross group uh, grievances, lack of uh, legitimacy of the state and level and other forms of the uh, high levels of violence. And this was sort of put together in a list as well. What we couldn't do was identify black swan, swan, black, black swan events, like you have at 9-11 or like the Madrid the, uh, train bombings or the Beslan siege in Russia. Now, so we look at these are the countries which we, 11 countries we came up with being most of this. Just let you look at that for a minute, and then I'll finish the presentation. These are just some of the other pieces of research we've done over the last couple of years. And that, my friends, is the end of one depressing presentation. <laughs> it's amazing that you give these presentations, you know, sometimes you give them, and you can, particularly if you're talking positive peace, you can look into people's eyes and you can see them getting inspired. So I'm looking around the room here, and I'm looking at everyone's eyes, finding the faces going. Anyway, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you.